So welcome to a job unlike any other. Um, graduate School is academic labor. It's a graduate um, workshop at SMS. Um, I'm Juan Yamas Rodriguez. I'm the graduate representative for SCMS. And um, this is a workshop, so I'll be introducing each of our panelists and then have, ask them to give a brief introduction to some um, comments. And then we'll open it up so that people will have comments, also questions, and then things that come up as, as the conversation goes, that goes along. Um, and a little bit of the logic for this workshop was to think of or rethink the idea that graduate school is preparing you for the job and also so sort of shed some light on the fact that grad students are already at a job in many, many different jobs. Um, and so the concerns about that, whether it's uh, unions or managing what people think your job as a grad student should be of writing the dissertation versus the day-to-day -day things that you are doing, uh, whether it's working as a, as a TA or as a research assistant um, and whatnot. And sort of practice, best practices to sort of work through that and how to affect some change and make some conditions better. So I think those, that was the general one. Um, I guess we'll go in this order. Um, and so I'll start by introducing Vicki Mayer. Vicki Mayer is a professor of communication at Tulane University. She's published widely on media production cultures and media labor, and her most recent project looks at the aura of film production work and precarity in the city of New Orleans. Um, <clears throat> does this sound good? Yeah? No one's ever complained that I'm too quiet. Um, I'm, I'm going to read because it's this hour in the morning. Um, so I remember uh, in 1996 or maybe 1997, um, and I was a grad student at UC San Diego, and enough students had signed cards that would um, justify having a vote uh, for whether to uh, join as a chapter of the UAW. Um, and so the way that we have somebody here who can speak more to the legal issues, but my understanding at the time was like, if enough people sign, the UC is required to hold a vote. Um, and, but because the UC at that time had kept the hard position, the TAs were not employees, they refused um, to vote. And they did all sorts of uh, tactics to, you know, uh, you know, remind us, you know, about the delicate mentor-mentee relationship that would be damaged by recognizing us as employees and all sorts of things. Um, so there was always these kind of like precious terms used for what we were doing in the academy. Um, and I have to say, I, I was I was not an organizer. I, I've never been like directly a union organizer. And, and I remember at the time, like in 96, like even like not even really knowing, like, do I support it? Do I not support it? Like I wasn't like, I, I didn't grow up in a family like unions, you must support them or unions, you must hate them. Like I was just kind of curious, what is this? Um, and I knew some people in the organizing group, but I wasn't like, uh, you know, there were, you know, like individual personalities that I wasn't, you know, they weren't like part of my friend group. and I. Always like I've always been kind of an unruly, honorary person, right? Like if somebody says you should do this, I'm always like, why? You know, I'm. You know, uh. um, and I have to say, what changed me and what twisted, you know, like changed my feelings about grad student unionization was this issue about um, UC not allowing a vote, um, and because, you know. I had a series of experiences, and it was over really like a one to two year period, where just by raising the conversation, like just like positing, like you know, should you know, because I was actually like just kind of collecting information, right? Like, should we unionize? Should you know, what do you think about it? Anyone from faculty to administration would like just shut down, and like administration especially just shut down and could not. Suddenly, like, you know, people who were rational became hysterical, calm people became enraged, generous people suddenly became vindictive, all sorts of weird things happened. And this happened, all series of, like, really unpleasant encounters, like, ranging from, like, 
a keynote panel that I gave at a consoling passions at 19, 1998 where like I was like persona non grata then with like a whole series of senior faculty from then on just for raising the issue um, to like uh, you know I, I remember like vividly like um, our chancellor on a call-in radio show and I had the gall to like call in and ask him about the vote and he like got so like angry like on the radio for just asking the question so that really like I, I think, think like you know you know the other side of patronage is like patronizing and they were so awful that I was like fuck it I like we uh, you know like we should like do this and um, and anyway, I think the quickest way to galvanize support is to expose how dismissive those with authority can be towards those with less power. Um, fast forward to 2010. 20 years later, I'm at a university in which the conditions have changed, but attitudes, I find, have not. Um, and I'd be curious, I actually wanted to be part of this panel because I'm just curious if anybody knew about strategies for people like me in the South who live in right to work states where um, labor is such a like bad word and mm -hmm. it's such a like hard, like you want to see people go crazy, you know, like that's a really hard issue to bridge. And I just came out of a graduate program review actually where like the whole discussion by the, the um, like the people who were doing the reviewing was how TA assignments were good for students, how that like, and, and never mind that mostly grads I meet now are so dis disenchanted with the academy, they don't want academy jobs, so you really, like why should they have to TA if they have no interest in teaching? What, like, and then I have to listen to my you know, colleagues who say like, you know, um, somehow like preparation for academic jobs involves like, you know, scantrons and, you know, these uh, grading journals, right? Um, I think it's dark times right now in a lot of states for labor, and in particular, um, grad student labor. And um, and I, I think that that's dark times for all labor then across the board, and that, that, that toughness really hurts solidarity where people are fighting over turf. Um, you know, for a shrink, shrunken portion of the pie, um, we have to remember that you know faculty governance is all but eliminated a lot of systems. So even if faculty want to be supportive, there's no voice for doing it. You know, there's no place. Um, and that you know wages have been so stagnant for everyone except for administrators who you know go crazy. Um, so. The only things I can say is that um, that I do think faculty can do better. I mean, I think if in systems with unions, faculty can, uh, if not join, if not visit, but then join the picket lines instead of hold, just holding the same classes that they would hold off campus. Um, I think in systems that are unable or unlikely to unionize, faculty need to be to actually speak up to these issues in places where grad students aren't invited or aren't allowed or don't feel like they can speak. Um, and I really think that they also need to take hard stands, such as refusing to pit adjuncts against grad students, which I see a lot now. Um, and finally, I feel like we all need to be better listeners, and that's really what I'm here to do, is um, to just get a better sense of the ground before um, assuming the economic conditions from which grad students speak. Thanks. Thank you. Our next presenter is Brady Fletcher. Brady Fletcher is a doctorate, doctoral candidate in the Department of Cinema Studies at New York University and Director of Forensics at the University of Rochester. His research interests include transformations and representations of ecology in avant-garde and documentary cinema, intersections and interactions between aesthetic and political concerns in ecological criticism, the rhetoric of ecology and environmentalism, and the emerging field of ecosystem studies. As a graduate employee at NYU, he worked as an organizer to win back collective bargaining rights, where he and his colleagues, and subsequently served on the bargaining committee, where he's 
we recognize Jinian, the GSO. GSOQ A W G S O Q A W. Thank you. <laughs> Helping to win its second historic contract and the only contract for a private university. He's currently researching and writing his doctoral dissertation. Uh, that was a long bio. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, 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 I, first, I want to say I'm really thankful uh, to be able to be here in this workshop and with all of you, and thank you, Juan, for inviting me to participate. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm here because I, as it indicated in my bio, have some recent experience uh, organizing and working uh, in grad and grad employee unions. And I, uh, uh, I do have to say, as a little sort of caveat, I, I've been out of uh, active participation in my union for a little while now, for over a year and a half. So, or about a year, let's say. But um, uh, so this has really been an occasion for me to reflect on my experience with the union. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, I'll, I'll you know I'll try to sort of um, uh, and what I'm going to try to kind of do is via that experience give you all kind of a sense for uh, hopefully how you know unionization works, what its goals can be, uh, at, um, uh, for all of us. Um, and, and so just to clarify, GSOC UAW is a Graduate Student Organizing Committee uh, with the United Auto Workers, uh, so the same union uh, that Vicky was talking about. In UC system, and I, and I do have to say that uh, you know really the UC organizing really paved the way for what you know everyone else has been doing for years now. So you know thank you for standing up and raising that question so many times because uh, it had a huge effect. Um, and so uh, so I, I do just want to kind of start by reacting to the title uh, of the panel. And so uh, one of the biggest difficulties in uh, organizing uh, with, you know with graduate employees is. Uh, Getting folks to recognize that they're they're do they are in fact doing a job uh, like any other, and uh, and that uh, and that they're workers, and that they sort of deserve rights, and they, and they of course ultimately deserve to have some say over their uh, conditions of employment. Um, now, I do think that our our jobs are jobs unlike others uh, in one key way, which is or a couple ways, but really it's our structural position within uh, the university. Um, and uh, uh, and you know as a really what it, what it comes down to very often a source of very cheap labor uh, for our institutions um, and, uh, uh, and and that's of course complicated uh, by which I think Vicky also is getting at sort of academic culture uh, uh, issue academic cultural issues um, that I think we often encounter um, uh, but I'll I'll say more about that um, uh, and and. And so, you know, we often are getting really great training in uh, political and social thought, and we're becoming really good political and social thinkers. Um, but at the same time, we're not very often, very often not considering our own, you know, location um, and you know how we uh, uh, are in a political space and you know are part of uh, a, a bigger structure, a bigger institution. Um, and so, uh, and very seldom, ch you know, should challenge that position. Um, and uh, uh, it's especially difficult to do this because, uh, as I, I would probably observe, that I would observe that our roles are really kind of ideologically fashioned to deflect and defer those challenges, uh, those political contestations. We're called apprentices. You know, we're sort of uh, we're supposed to be very thankful for the um, places that we have in our departments, and you know, and. And, uh, and so we're really, we end up feeling very beholden and sort of internalized, right, that culture. Um, and, uh, and we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to, you know, kind of stir things up. Um, and for fear of, you know, uh, not only this big looming fear of, like, no one will ever hire me, you know, but also just the, the idea that, you know, faculty in our departments, maybe our advisor, we don't know how they feel about unions. And we have these relationships with people that we're really worried about. So it becomes um, a, a big challenge organizing um, and getting folks to what people ultimately have to do, stand up and sort of say, I support the union. And as Vicki said, raise the question um, again and again and again. Um, uh, and so, uh, um, okay. Uh, uh, I, I also just want to say, the grad employee labor situation, this recognition of ourselves as workers is especially important, I think, because it's a time in our lives where we're a precarious form of, you know, labor, but 
We're also uh, coming into starting long-term commitments to our partners, starting families, and really, you know, setting up lives for ourselves, um, if only somewhat provisionally in terms of the geography that we're in or whatever, right? But um, we're, I think that we're, we're really in this, in this transitional moment where um, it's really, in fact, very important that we have uh, you know, economic justice for ourselves uh, because uh, it's, it's a, it can be a very financially straining time. Um, so now I just want to sort of say some things you know, about unionization and I'll talk about NYU. Um, and so uh, I should say grad unions, you know, just so that uh, everyone's aware, you know, really not an isolated or strange phenomenon anymore. It's sort of something that's happening in a lot of places and I'd be interested in hearing if any of you all have any experiences. Um, but uh, of course, the UC system, as Vicky was mentioning, but you know, UMass Amherst, University of Connecticut. Um, there's organizing campaigns happening at the New School in Columbia, New York, and uh, of course at uh, NYU. Uh, we just got, you know, uh, not just, but uh, about you know, uh, a little under a year ago, got our uh, uh, second contract. Uh, we were for the second time the first private university uh, to uh, have a graduate uh, employee contract. So um, uh, it's something that's happening. Um, and so look, I just want to, I'll give some quick background uh, about NYU. Uh, we won a really hard fought campaign in the late 90s uh, and around 2000 uh, to, to, and we ended up, you know, losing the union under Bush. And really what it ended up being was sort of the political tides changed. And this is something that is an ongoing problem, but the National Labor Relations Board entity that sort of adjudicates labor issues, labor disputes, uh, ended up getting, you know, sort of turning Republican under the Bush administration, and they passed a case that de-recognized graduate employees as employees, uh, and, you know, rendered us suddenly stroke of a pen, not workers anymore. Uh, and so a lot of unions stopped getting, uh, a lot of organizing was impacted by this, and NYU, the NYU administration simply turned its back on the union. Uh, and stopped and refused to negotiate after our contract expired, uh, and so it, you know it, things sort of uh, uh, really uh, uh, stalled. And after that, organizing kind of continued for a number of years, um, and uh, and really it was a challenge. You know, the challenge with organizing under those conditions as well. We had this very difficult fight with the university when they ignored the union, and so we lost. And so that loss got really internalized by a lot of people. Everyone got very demoralized. Um, and then to complicate that, as we know, there are high rates of turnover, not only in grad employees who are working in different semesters, but also just people graduating and new people coming in. And so uh, it, it, it's a very big challenge to keep people aware of the union and to get people um, you know, to sort of really become leaders and help sustain it, which is the goal, um, ultimately. And so that went on for a number of years, and uh, uh, really momentum didn't pick up until 12, 13, when a really concerted effort at organizing uh, across the university happened. And, and uh, that is to say, uh, uh, one thing that we can maybe talk about more is that I think that uh, labor organizing uh, in academic institutions very often gets sort of siloed in uh, humanities and social science departments. Um, and, and and we, we, we often really overlook uh, a huge percentage of workers at our institutions in the hard sciences, uh, as well as, um, uh, and, and, and they are, by the way, like particularly exploited uh, because you know, this, sort of, this wonderful other category called research assistant uh, in, in laboratories across universities exists, and uh, those folks deal with all kinds of issues, uh, including like intellectual property stuff, um, and it can be really, really challenging. So, so we started organizing with those folks um, uh, a lot more intensively and we had a sort of campaign of escalation uh, where you know, we were really just highly organized, had leaders across the university, um, and ultimately we got a, a voluntary recognition um, from the university. And so uh, uh, as opposed to a National Labor Relations Board decision to overturn the pr that previous decision, stay with me, you know, that said that we're not workers anymore. Uh, we got voluntary recognition from NYU. That's a key point for everyone to take home, is that we don't need to go through a lengthy legal process to have a graduate employee union uh, if we just have our institutions uh, grant us the power to be able to not even have a union, to choose whether we want to elect to have a union. Um, and, uh, and so if we get you know, uh, voluntary recognition from institutions, 
can be a very uh, efficient sort of pathway. Um, and it can happen. It, it happened with us. Um, it takes some more time. But, um, so, uh, uh, let me see. I have a couple more things to say. I know I've been talking for a while. Um, but uh, uh, the, the only other thing, we, you know, we ended up winning our election uh, after we got recognition. It was amazing, and it was this wonderful moment, and then uh, bargaining started. And I would, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to talk in general more about part of the bargaining process, but uh, institutions are, I mean, just extremely skilled at uh, navigating that process. Um, and, uh, inst and academic institutions are learning how to engage in bargaining in more strategic and sort of tac tactical uh, uh, tactical ways, um, and so uh, it was a challenge for us. Um, we ended up deciding to focus on uh, issues of uh, folks that were the most vulnerable. Uh, we got some raises for folks. We got some family benefits, um, and, uh, and so we, we, we had some victories. But it was definitely challenging. Um, and uh, uh, so I'll just stop there and let others speak uh, because I know I've been going on. But um, again, really happy to be here, and I hope we can have a good conversation about this. <clears throat> um, our next panelist is Kelly Marshall. Kelly teaches a variety of film and television courses at DePaul University. I'm a, um, when Kelly's not teaching or live tweeting, she researches two separate fields, Shakespeare and film popular culture, and the star image and work of Hollywood song and dance. Um, an advocate of social media, Kelly's also interested in the integration of social and new media inside and outside the classroom, teaching with Twitter and video essays. Um, Kelly now serves as a columnist and, uh, for the Quantico. Um, okay, um, for, for that, uh, because of her expertise in, in these fields, integrated social media. She writes about how to incorporate technology into the traditional university classroom. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I feel as though I'm uh, maybe the only positive light in this, not necessarily. The only, but the positive light in some of the um, discussions that are, are being held here, because like Vicki was saying, labor is hard work, it's a bad word, union, those sorts of things. And basically my comments, um, as if, um, Juan spoke with me over email, was to share with you sort of my journey. So my comments really have to do today with what occurs after graduate labor. And um, the process that it took for me to get from the PhD to where I am today. So I'm essentially giving you a, a bit of a biography here, um, and then we can certainly talk about how um, my labor as a PhD student you know, uh, have happened there as well. So I'm gonna tell you some facts in the beginning really quickly. Um, it might make it sound as though I'm tooting my own horn, but I promise you there's a point to, to these. So I'll start with, I completed my PhD in, in five years, from 1999 to 2004. I tell you that because four to five years is about the minimum amount of time uh, for humanities candidates to complete their PhDs in the United States. Um, according to the Commission of the Future of Higher Education, nearly half of all candidates do not even finish their degree. So I'm just going to start with that one. So I completed my PhD in five years. I earned A's in all of my coursework. I held a teaching assistantship while working on my PhD, which meant that I was on the semester system, so I took nine hours and taught a class or two at the same time like every incoming graduate student. Um, I taught both rhetoric classes and introduction to literature. I was in a humanities program, so film was just a part of it. So I taught both rhetoric and introduction to literature. And about, I think the second or third, maybe the third uh, year of my PhD program, things began to change. My assistant dean asked me to create and teach a course on Shakespeare and film, something that had never been even taught in the department at this university and certainly never by a graduate student. So I agreed, I created it, I taught it, I loved it, it was great. A semester later, I was given the department's large lecture-based introduction of film course, which has about 90 to 100 students in it, not as a teaching assistant, but as the actual you know, instructor of the entire course. Again, my PhD colleagues were still teaching introduction to literature and rhetoric while I was doing this. Before I defended my dissertation, I published one of its chapters in the top uh, film adaptation journal, and I had presented parts of my dissertation at conferences like this one. So I tell you all this, again, not to toot my own horn, but in short to say, on paper, I did everything right. It seems as though I did everything right. 
Um, so the semester after graduation, my uh, dissertation advisor went on sabbatical. The school asked me, or the department asked me, to fill in for her for a year while she was on sabbatical. So if I, was, if I accepted this, I'd be given a salary, I'd be given insurance, I'd be given benefits, I'd be given upper-level Shakespeare courses, graduate-level film courses, and the title visiting assistant professor. So this is right after my PhD was completed. So with such experience as all this, it seems as though I'm in a very, very good position for the job market, at least on paper, right? And it also seems as though I should be able to function within an English department and a film department since I have this, this experience with Shakespeare and with film and, and literature and all of this. So I said yes to the, um, to the offer, but because of the amount of energy and prep time that it took to take on a position right out of a PhD program, I did not enter the job market that academic. So, if you're keeping track, this is 2006. So I began to send out job applications in the fall of 2006, about <coughs> two years after I completed the degree. I sent out about 60 letters, there were no bites. I'm sure that some of you have probably had some similar experiences. So the following year, 2007 to 2008, and if you've seen the big short or were around at that time, you know what was happening with the economy, right? In 2007, 2008, it was not happening. Not, nothing good happening uh, in academia really at that point either. So I applied for more jobs, I got a couple of interviews, I got one on campus position, but nothing panned out. I ultimately took a job on a whim within three weeks of the job beginning in the University of Toledo, in Toledo, Ohio. So going from Dallas to Toledo, Ohio in three weeks. Um, it was a three year term, I learned how to drive in the snow, I learned that you're supposed to put sandbags in the back of your trunk so that your car doesn't do all of this. Uh, this is coming from a southerner, I had no idea about anything Toledo, Ohio. Um, and because Detroit was only about 40 miles away, we learned all about the Motor City and Motown. So we learned some stuff in, in Toledo, Ohio. Three years after the job ended, my husband, who was also in higher education, but on the student affairs side of things, was unemployed. I was unemployed. We were both unemployed. Whoever got a job first, we were going to go. He got a job in Chicago, so I followed. Um, for three years, I taught as an adjunct at both DePaul University and at Columbia College Chicago, which is about uh, a seven-block walk away from each other. So, as I'm an adjunct at both of these schools, my classes are capped at 15 to 30 students. I teach in smart classrooms. Um, there's plush seats, there's tiered rows, it's a perfect classroom for teaching film. Um, I had an office with a computer, with a printer, with a copy machine access. I contributed to a I was never made to feel like an adjunct. Um, I was invited to department parties. I went over to dinners at, for, at my colleagues' houses. Um, so cobbling together the money between the two schools and the adjunct positions I had, I made close to the starting salary of an assistant professor in the humanities in some areas of the United States. Most important, I think, to me was that I was asked consistently to contribute to curriculum based on my teaching and research interests. So at the beginning at Gregory Corner, uh, the dean would ask, what is it that you can offer our students this term? So unlike some adjuncts, uh, again, after this graduate labor, uh, who are required to teach the same exact introduction to rhetoric or introduction to literature over and over and over, I was consistently creating brand new courses. So just to tell you this, that my situation as an adjunct was not the horrific one. Um, that is often detailed within academia and within the popular press more recently. Um, so after applying for a job really on a whim, one of my colleagues said, have you seen the job that we're you know, opening up for our department? I said, yeah, I saw it. But it wasn't totally my area of expertise, so I didn't really apply for it. Um, but after applying for that job on a whim, I am now a full-time faculty member at DePaul University, the school at which I've been adjuncting for the past three years. So I have benefits, I have retirement, and I'm, I'm that sort of rare unicorn, which is why I was saying that I'm, I'm kind of that positive light, maybe, um, in this discussion on adjuncting and labor and that sort of thing. So I'll just close really quickly with two bits of advice, the first of which is to get to know people in your field. Um, introduce yourself at conferences like this, make acquaintance, be on Twitter, converse with people, because um, it is through a conference just like this um, that I met a colleague who basically threw my name into the pot at DePaul University and really helped me get the job to, to where I am today. Um, and then secondly, if, if you really know without a doubt that academia is the place for you, 
Um, and I know that you read all of those articles that say, don't go to grad school, this is horrible, you know, all of these sorts of things. But if you know that is, without a doubt, your road, your path, I would definitely be wary. Um, but I would also, don't let, necessarily let the current situation deter you completely from that decision. Because even in the part-time arena, uh, which I just left, um, it's not always as dire as everyone thinks it's seeing, or at least in my case, um, it's, it's not a bit that. So. to design the Archive Media System for archiving and analyzing content from social networking sites. Uh, she holds an MFA in Digital Arts and New Media from University of California, Santa Cruz, an MA in Arab Studies from Georgetown University, and a PhD in Media Arts and Practice from the University of Southern California. Um, I think that so these are our austere times, I think. I think we are living in particularly austere economic conditions for the last 10 years. It's not, it's been going on, and I think that's uh, what, one of the reasons why we might be having this conversation today. Um, it's not an old, it's not a new conversation. Um, and I, just to, to say that we all have different paths, this is very important in academia, we all have very different paths to get where we get. Um, and, I, and we must, you, we must all honor our own paths and understand why, you know, why the path you took led you to where you went. I, I, I assume that the reason why I was invited to this panel is because I've been a grad student for like 20 years. I've been, you know, I have uh, my path has been a lot of graduate education, um, like more than I needed as well, but a lot of it. So um, just a, a quick background. Uh, I finished my undergraduate in 1993 in literature, and I thought, okay, I really, you know, I really want to move on into academia. And I knew it was just, it was just, I didn't know what I wanted to do. It was just, I had no focus. So I spent years doing a bunch of other stuff, and it wasn't until and I did a master's in '98, and then it really wasn't until I um, had a very clear vision of what I wanted to, why I wanted to go back. Now, and that started in 2007 when I went to my MFA at UC Santa Cruz. So, so 2007. So I really haven't like do that. Really, I haven't had a like a career job until now. So I I finished my PhD in 2015, and I started a tenure track job in July. Um, but my road, though, even though that might seem like oh wow, but my road was a long one to get there. Um, so that being said, and I have to say, uh, so now I'm an assistant professor and things are not that much different. And I'm sorry to say that, but that's the truth. I am, I don't feel like there's like much economic difference. I'm still, I mean, by the time they took the taxes off, the taxes out and all those other things, I'm in the same boat actually. And um, so I see it as one long, path, you know, from a grad student all the way. And I see professors, you know, full professors are still dealing with the same stuff, right? It doesn't stop. Um, and I think this is an important thing to think about, that we're, we're looking at graduate students, but maybe to, to really, and for everyone to think about it, even for the professors and those of us who are at different points in this authority structure, to remember that we've all, we're all at different, we're all along the same path, and as we get I, in my opinion, as you become more and more enlightened as a professor, you become more humbled, actually, and you, I think it's that the more humbling and the more um, modest you actually become. Uh, that should be the route. Um, that should be the case. So 
So that being said, also I have to say I'm an anti-authoritarian, I'm an activist, uh, my politics are, I'm an anarchist at some level, um, so I, I really don't have any qualms with speaking up against authority at any time. I've never had that problem. Um, and now that I'm in this position, it's like, hmm, authority, now I'm thinking about authority again. But that's really, the, that's sort of, that's my modus operandi, always. So um, I'm just going to answer, I prepared a couple uh, answers to the questions that you sent out. So I don't have a lot of experience in labor uh, unions, which is um, for no reason other than it doesn't happen, although I was at, you know, sort of a, uh, in Washington, D.C., I was a, you know, a grassroots activist doing community building around international issues and around issues around um, Planned Parenthood and around all kinds of other issues are, are, are war on terror everywhere and all that stuff. So that's where my focus has been. But I'm going to answer three particular questions that Juan threw out to us. Uh, one which was, um, when system-wide changes in academic employment occur, what are uh, some of the uh, grassroots are the most effective, often, and the least equipped to respond? So what are some of the strategy, strategies to deal with these changes? And I think we've all sort of said it, but my big, uh, I, I would say two words, organize, 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 and work together. So I think the most important thing, whether it's through a labor union, it, it doesn't even have to be a labor union, but at least the grad students in your department, you should have some sort of an organization, organi an organized body of sorts, at the very least. If you, you know, in, my, in both my uh, MFA program and my PhD program, they were fledgling programs, right? So there were, there was, there were no rules, which I loved. Um, that's why I did it. Um, so there were, no, there were no established procedures in place. Um, but there were also no organizations. So it was, a pro it was like, uh-uh. Like, so we had to create these sort of ad hoc grad, you know, we just got together. We're like, let's get together and talk about these issues, and then let's go to the faculty. And that's the grassroots organizing. Put labor aside, put, you can, you know, you don't have, I mean, unionizing is maybe another step. But at the very, very least, you should all have an organized body, even if it's ad hoc, even if it's informal, among yourselves. That is simple, actually. And then you can collectively talk to your faculty. And that collective voice has a lot more power and resonance. And you can, that way you can also work through ideas together. And that way you can also learn, you can also, you also have a, it's a bonding experience. Um, and I agree with Kelly. You, know, you need to, you know, the, the just networking, getting to know people in your field, inside your department, outside your department. This is really the biggest strategy I can offer. Um, the second point, which is related, and I thought this was an interesting question, I'm going to challenge you on the way the question was, was asked. So the question is, what are some advantages and potential problems from engaging in side, uh, side work, and that's the part, side work during the dissertation phase? Phase. And the and examples, writing for popular websites or developing digital projects. And so I was like, wait a minute, developing a digital project was not side, it was actually quite central to my work, it was my project. Um, so to determine what is side work and what is not, I think is something that, again, is unique to everybody's project. So it depends really on what your research is. However, there is, um, and however, I do think that if your work, it has to do with digital media in some capacity, if that is your, the nature, you're not researching, um, you know, historical work, or even if you are working on digitizing the historical work, in some, some respect your work is on digital media, um, you know, my, I think that praxis is is central, it's a central methodological approach. I think it's necessary, that's kind of what I do. It's media practice, it's theory and practice. So, um, you know, it is a research methodology, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so I think that if you are gonna develop a digital project, let that be central. Let that be part of your, method your research methodology, how you're going about asking your questions. Because really, did developing a project like that, you learn a lot. Um, doing digital projects, most often require collaboration, so you learn to work with others. Um, again, that's part of the whole organizing mentality. You also, um, you also, especially as a media scholar, 
um, you, you get to learn your medium in ways that you would never think of before, right, when you start trying to produce it. And you're not necessarily having to produce something for uh, the commercial market, thank God. So you can fail. And you learn from your failure, and that's what you write about. Totally fine. So that's one thing. The other thing is the idea of writing for popular websites. Um, Henry Jenkins, um, one of my professors from USC, uh, just, I was just talking to him yesterday. He's now teaching a class on the intellectual, the public intellectual. That's his whole thing. And he has this great blog, Confessions of, I don't know what, blah, blah, a long web title. Um, you know it? Yeah, Akafan, yes. Yeah, and he, so he's, he's, he's touched, you know, teaching public intellectual now, and he has it one blog. And I thought, that's great, that's great. You know, it's Henry Jenkins, so for him, blogging is like, uh, it's not necessarily side work, and he's very prolific, so it's not hard and uncomparable. However, um, the blog, the, the, work do, the work that you get to do with, as a public intellectual really helps, I think, grad students it's, again, another exercise, another learning exercise, but it does several things. One, when you are writing for popular sites, you get out of your jargon. So you have to learn to write concise. You have to learn to write across disciplines. And that is a powerful tool in uh, when you want to, like, fight for your, 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 your you, have, you want to make a case for yourself. You're able to make a case of pe people outside of your is really important in institutions because often people are not getting tenure because they're they can't make their case to people who are in other fields who don't understand right so you're you know being able to write to a popular audience allows you to learn to to learn to how to speak brief simple to the point and and then you also kind of like oh that's really what I mean <laughs> because you're able to get into a nutshell the other thing it does um, is you know I think it's it's even maybe even more powerful than going to conferences because your work can go out, right? It can really spread and you can have conversations and blogs are great because people, the point of the blog is discussion. So you get all these discussions afterwards. You know, I, I did a blog on Henry's page a while ago and Alex Hughes wrote back and now we, did, we, did a, we ended up doing a collaboration together because of the blog. So I'm saying that I don't think of it as side work I do think of it as central, and I do think it is actually central and important um, because of the reason that I just explained. And then the last question you asked, um, this is all, and this is really important, and I think this is sort of a question and a statement at the same time, which is, what should grad students ask from advisors, home departments, university administrators to better prepare for their current job and future job searches, and how do you ask for this? So this is really important, I think. Um, and I don't, I mean, you know, I only have the experience in, in the institutions that I've been in. I don't know what it's like other, in other places. Um, again, that organize, organize, organize. I really think every department must have, you're, you're, you must have some sort of an organizing body for the rest, within the department, of the department. And um, then you should simply, um, you, you could, I would go to the graduate, whoever is the graduate faculty advisor, and tell them that you need um, workshops on how to get into the you know, job search workshops of sorts. Um, at USC, there was a class that we were all required to take that was one unit, and it was about, it was called professionalization. Steve Anderson taught it. Um, and it was like, we would literally spend days reading people, reading applications, and reading other people's applications, so we would read each other. So there was a lot of peer critique, a lot of peer review. Um, and then whenever anybody had a job talk, we would do a mock job talk, and everybody would come, and we would all learn from it, and tell them how to dress, and like all the details. There was also, um, we asked for a wiki, uh, so that we could have all the jobs in one place, and we would know what was, you know, what the jobs were. Um, and then we also had, you know, at, at USC, they, we were not assumed that our jobs were necessarily, necessarily going to be academic jobs. So they were trying to think about, you know, prof professionalization, how to get you on the job market more broadly um, than just academic jobs. So there, you know, but we, it was in place at USC. I don't know that it's in place everywhere. I think it's a very simple thing to go and ask them to say, we really need this. And, 
Also keep in mind the time, you know, the academic schedule. So jobs go on in the you know, it goes on in the fall, and it's probably something to really have, a, you know, the early part of the spring quarter, because that's when your application will be, or maybe in the fall quarter. But something to think about, like there is the process, and maybe having a couple workshops would be really helpful, and making them like a very um, hands-on, practical practice, peer-reviewed, peer-critiqued one, so that everybody gets to learn from each other. Those are my advice. Yeah, it doesn't really change. I'm still in very austere measures, and I'm still um, wondering about my own right, my own. How do I manage my own work? How do I manage my own? So I'm still in the same situation. So I don't know that. I don't. I would like to learn and hear about how we can move forward. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so. Small group. So we'd also love to hear uh, from you if you have questions, comments, or want to react to something that someone um, said in the bill. Um, that. So if that's how we can. Sure. I need to relate some of my own experience with unions. Um, I got my master's. Yeah. Sorry, I got my master's at the University of Minnesota, and there was an effort to organize grad students there in I believe 2012. Um, and. The university began a very extensive and very calculated anti-labor um, um, or basically movement against us. There were they hired unions to spread disinformation. Um, they set up like reportedly independent anti-union websites, and they were very successful at, in particular, um, attracting all of the other substantial majority of grad students outside of the humanities to their side, um, convincing them that um, paying union dues would be an undue burden on them, that uh, if they were in a program, in the, especially in the sciences, that were paid on average higher than a lot of other people in the humanities, that their wages would be lowered. Um, or that, you know, that basically they'd be placed at a lower threshold than they were currently. And they actually were promised um, some raises that they ended up not getting. So it was, it was very, very sinister. Um, and the labor, it went, when it went up for a vote in 2012, the vote ended up actually failing by almost two to one margin. Almost all of the no votes coming from the sciences on the business programs. And basically, anything that wasn't like a humanities program. The humanities programs overwhelmingly voted in favor of it. Um, so I, I guess I want to bring this up because I, I do notice potentially a uh, uh, a separation between enthusiasm or at least support for unions within humanities programs, which maybe are more uh, you know, formally trained in recognizing areas of social justice and things like that, than in science programs, which are just as if not more exploited in humanities programs, but still don't see themselves in the same way. Um, and there was a real difficulty in mobilizing them toward the, the union cause. Um, so I'm wondering, if there are any anecdotes or, or strategies that you know of from past union movements in terms of attracting people across different disciplines and different departments, because it's one thing to mobilize people who are already inclined to be in support of you, but to actually attract new uh, converts is very critical. Yeah. I mean, I can address that in terms of how it worked at UCSD. So, so at UCSD is a lot of uh, most of the grad students are in the sciences because it's a very science, technology heavy um, uh, university. And at the time, I knew a lot of the um, opposition was in the sciences because I was actually president of the Grad Student uh, Association. So I was like the government person. So like, there was a whole weird thing, right? Like I couldn't, because I represented all grad students I couldn't uh, like be like there was a strange rules about like when I could be with like union folks and like when I could like declare my union status and when I could declare my uh, like represent you know like GSA representation right so so like for example if I said oh I'm coming to talk about union issues I couldn't get a, like a meeting with the president or the chancellor but if I said oh I'm head of the GSA. 
come on in. Yeah. And so I knew, so that's why I was saying like in my talk, like the main thing that I think shifted my perception, it shifted a lot of people's perception, was just the, the patronizing attitudes of the university. Because otherwise scientists, they were like, well, we make more as RAs. We make, we're doing, you know, like, we have student housing, we're fine. Um, you know, in the humanities, there were a lot more, at that time, uh, people with family issues were in the humanities, whereas scientists still at that time tended to be like, uh, single, you know, mostly dudes, like working in labs, right? So there were there were different issues, but it was just like just making the that um, animosity and that patronizing attitude transparent, like calling into the Colin show and having the chancellor like publicly to the city of San Diego talk so disparagingly about you know how we all need to know our place brought scientists, right? It wasn't about wages or benefits or anything. It was simply like being infantilized, infantilized, and making that super transparent what was going on that like eventually and, and always just coming back to it like, well, if you're so if you're so um, you know, you I'd start the conversation like, so we believe in governance, we believe in democracy. Why won't you just allow a vote? If you're so certain we're gonna lose, just let the vote happen. What you're so afraid of, right? So it would just be this like coming back to like just like exposing the like complete hypocrisy and the attitudes behind it that I think flipped a lot of scientists. That was my experience. Yeah, I I, I have a couple thoughts. And uh, so the, the first thing I would say is that uh, I think that in terms of an anti-union uh, dynamic that forms within campaigns like this. Um, I think that they're, once again, you know, similar uh, and the same, but while also different in some ways. And so similar in that, I mean, universities, uh, like any institution or, you know, corporation, are going to figure out the best tactical approach to defeat what you're trying to do. I mean, you know, they don't want you to have power, and they don't want you to, you know, change anything. They just don't. And uh, for some people uh, at the administrative level, uh, it's merely a sort of economic analysis. For others, I, it's actually, and we found this, a principled issue. People, you know, administrators very firmly believing uh, in their power and are not having any. <laughs> so, so that's that's the reality. And and in that, but in that way, uh, you know, this is not different from any other industry, right? That's the same. It happens. The same way, uh, in any you know organizing context, um, you know uh, a business will try to figure out right how to bust the union. Um, it, divide where, and conquer. Divide and conquer, and and where it's different, and I think this is where we get into sort of the fine grain of like, well, how do we organize in an academic context given the you know dispositions of people and the cultures of academic departments and the differences between like the hard sciences and the humanities. That's a different uh, question, and that's where that's where I think you know we have to sort of learn to be a little bit strategic. And and you know as I mentioned before, I think that the biggest problem that can happen um, is over the long term not uh, addressing people who are academically across the gulf from you. And so you know people in the hard sciences, people in engineering schools, you know STEM really right, and these are folks who. Uh, will really be the first people that are going to be targeted uh, in an anti-union campaign. Um, and, and this is where it's, it's different also. The, I, I would sort of, just to give people an idea of how these campaigns can start, um, they really, you know, all that the universities really, universities have to do mo in most cases to begin an anti-union campaign, I'd be interested in hearing your experience more if this happened, but um, it's raising the question of this controversial thing that's different, um, and that is compromising our sacred academic space, uh, or could potentially compromise it. Um, and so, you know, we're an exceptional situation. We are, you know, apart from the rest of society. We're not a public sphere. We're not political. We are academia. We are above <laughs> it all, right? And so, and so, you know, exploiting that, I sort of, we 
weird utopian idealism or whatever um, uh, it, it, to, to make the union seem like a very controversial thing is, the, is really the first threshold in, in, in terms of my experience with a lot of anti-union campaigns. Um, and, and they're always going to say, I mean, it's really like the same playbook, you know, every time. And, um, uh, but yeah, when it comes to the hard sciences, it really comes down to just having conversations. I know that's been another theme, and I, you know, you were commenting Layla, about Layla, right? Yeah. About, about this. But it, it really is uh, just a matter of, over a long haul, so semester after semester after semester after semester, you know, going and engaging with people in, in really uncomfortable, awkward situations, in labs, in mm -hmm. the hallways of science departments, in, you know, places where, you know, uh, as a humanities scholar, I would, you know, I, I just was nervous about knocking things over and like, you know, whatever. It was very, it was, it was strange and it was difficult, but it was absolutely important um, because what you come to find is, you know, you've got to have a lot of conversations and you've got to find the people that are supportive and they're there. They're definitely there. Uh, it's just a matter of, and this is the university's tactical perspective, sort of making those people feel like they're alone. And, and that they don't have any leadership potential within their department in terms of saying why a union is a good idea. And so reaching out across those boundaries, you know, makes people feel like they're not alone, and it also, you know, helps to uh, uh, empower them to talk to their colleagues, right, in their labs and about the work that they do. Um, uh, and again, that first threshold, uh, hard sciences have the same problem we do, and it's, and it's seeing themselves as workers. Um, they have really toxic uh, environments oftentimes. Well, well, maybe literally and figuratively, but they have, they have toxic environments in that, you know, they, uh, working as RA, work as RAs really often uh, is a heavily hierarchical uh, situation, you know, much more than I think we experience in the humanities or social sciences, and, um, and it can be really, really, uh, I mean, demeaning and demoralizing and, and really tough. So people's spirits are, you know, very close to broken often. Times and so talking to people and, and, and having lots of conversations um, and, and again, you know, um, I know that seems like it's simple, but those conversations are difficult and you know you have to have them. You have to have a lot of them. Um, so it takes a lot of energy and it's a sustained effort. But um, that's the that's the first threshold for, for organizing, and you, and you have to do it or else the university's going to that message about. I, I have to say, you know, so I I actually have a very negative idea, I, I don't, I have a pessimistic approach to like trying to deal with institution because I have this sort of like view that it's, I haven't seen change in a long time. These institutions are still, I think that, I think that the power issues are so much deeper. Um, I think we have some racial issues that are just not addressed. Um, we now have a political national catastrophe watching the rise of fascism in our own country. And um, it's serious. So, so I actually think that a lot of these mechanisms are broken, or they work within the system. So I'm trying to find ways to work outside of that system altogether. I'm not trying to work. In. And the old, for me, the only answer are people. It's, it's going, and I don't know, I don't have, I don't actually know how to do that. I don't have an idea how to do that. But I do think that, that our systems fails us in so many ways. I think that some of the problems are, are structurally um, deep and they're, they're not easy to overcome. You can go and because, like you said, you go and the, the, the institutional um, person in power, that structure of power is in place and they want to uphold it. And if that's the case, then, you're gonna, then we have to think of new ways. Um, and I think part of those new ways are actually, I, I think that the blog could help with those new ways in the sense that you want to talk to your colleague across, you know, who's over in computer science. And actually, you know what, they're interested in what we're doing. They're, um, I'm now, you know, like, they're interested in how cult, how their algorithms are affecting culture. They're cur they don't know how to, they can't, they don't know how to, they don't have the tools for analyzing culture. Um, they make these algorithms, but they're concerned, you know. So how do you, you know, how to talk to, how to, like, explain your work to them, I think is really, it's not easy. But when you learn how to do that, then you, you start forging relationships, not just friendships, and not just about that, but also about the actual, your actual research, which is why you're, you're raison d'etre, right? You're, <laughs> why you're here. Um, 
So that's why I go back to you know organizing, 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 and just being the like, learning to connect with as many people in your institution as possible. I cannot agree more. But personally, I have just sort of I don't know how to work within the system for change. I have, I'm trying to figure out new ways, and I'm open to participating with other people in figuring that out. But that's my sort of negative, pessimistic. <laughs> It seems like there is this really interesting tension between, um, I think like the question was raised earlier about, are universities a business? And I feel like a lot of the discussions that I hear about uh, labor rights and particularly unionization within higher education revolves around getting students, grad students, to understand that universities function very similarly to a corporation. Uh, which is interesting, considering that so much of the sort of rhetorical thrust of like, reforming higher ed over the last 30 years and then trying to get us away from that notion that corporation, that university should not be a corporation, right? Um, so, like, should we just acknowledge that, yes, the schools that we go to are businesses and that we just accept that kind of outright and that we should just be guaranteed the same kind of rights as other workers would be in the or there's something about the university that would be different than any business, ideally. We see ourselves as workers, but not other corporations. I mean, well, I mean, we are living in a capitalist yeah. system, and that's so every everything we do is part of that transaction. That's all I'm saying. I do think that there's sort of, I mean, you know, I, I I'm just, I'm not totally prepared to answer this question, but I'll try. So it's just, you know, my understanding is. Really, university administrations are uh, are, are just growing <laughs> at, at a really huge rate, at sort of out of control rate. And um, and what's interesting, and I don't remember where I, I read this, but there was some analysis that I read about uh, the, the the tracks that people are taking to become university administrators, and sort of and sort of who are university administrators. And I think it deals with you know, I, mean, I think Vicky, you were commenting on the. Lack of, and loss of faculty governance, yes. um, and, and really, like that's that's a big part of it. Is that you know academics are, are not really you know in charge of you know m of a lot of what happens at, at universities or in, even in their own departments in a lot of cases. And so um, instead, you have uh, really a managerial class uh, of administrators um, who uh, whose, whose salaries are growing while ours are not. You know and um, and, uh, and and I think I think that's a sort of structural shift that's been that's really been happening for a long time, uh, which is which makes it all the more interesting that that's been that the rhetoric of universities over the last you know as you said has been an attempt to move away from that. Um, but but I really do think that you know I mean I, I was just so surprised from the the sort of resistance that I encountered uh, at at NY, that we encountered at NYU and, and the way that. Um, and they were just so adept at, uh, at, at strategizing and, and dealing with us um, in, in bargaining. It was, it was really like, you know, it was such a, I mean, because I had been organizing and I've been like, yeah, university is a corporation. I've been like sort of saying all that stuff and whatever. And, and I sort of believed it. But then, like when I got in bargaining in the room with these folks and just sat across the table from them, I believed it. And I, I really knew it. Because none of them were academics. None of them, like, you know, had any idea what, like, you know, probably anybody is like actually researching or studying, right? But they're in charge of managing the university and in charge of its labor, um, and so, you know, and, and that's what they were there, uh, you know, to deal with. And, and so there's there's a whole, you know, uh, aspect of universities that I think is really going uh, un unchallenged in, in most places um, that we that we need. To I mean, if you just think about it, right? <clears throat> yes, a university is a business. But how do people feel when you say, like, um, your elementary school is also a business? Like, doesn't the university actually serve a role that should be towards a good that's higher than what a corporation serves? And so, even if it has a bottom line, let's think of it, right? Everybody has. Uh, has to go to elementary school, high school, college. 
right? Why is it suddenly when it's college, we should think of it mentally differently? Is it some kind of business that is different from the two businesses prior to it? And I think that that is the, the conversation that needs to happen personally to, to think about what kind of business should a university operate as in terms of its mission to society. And, and right now the, sh the teachers in Chicago are striking, speaking of like K-12 teachers, right? <clears throat> yeah, it makes sense. I think, I like, I mean, it's, it's a funny title, but I like the idea of thinking of the like and how the university is like a business, but and once you start parsing it down in sort of in terms of the players of where the faculty lies, the administration, and grassroots work at some level are, um, could be separate, but maybe they're not separate. So I'm interested in the idea of how these distinctions, as you all raised the different points about how it's not that different once you become an assistant professor, for example, um, or it's not that different from how science students versus humanities students. So sort of breaking down these ideas that they're different, not different from elementary school versus university, I think it's a part of the
we're also asking about money, right? I mean, financial support. And as you're talking about that as you are in your PhD program or in your program. Actually, as I'm applying. As you're applying. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, which um, I think that in, in my case, um, virtually everything was paid for because of the graduate assistantship. Um, I, I did not have massive amounts of student loans at all. I had student loans from an undergraduate uh, degree, but virtually nothing for my PhD. And again, I'm one of those rare people who had spousal support too. Um, so I don't know that, I mean, I have answers for that necessarily, but I didn't pick up on the financial you know, concerns that you have, and certainly those are definitely concerns. Um, but yeah, having someone else who has a real job you know, in the picture definitely helps with that. But, um, yeah, the assistantship for me uh, pretty much took care of all of that, that worry, in, in my case. Was that a factor for any of you in choosing your graduate program? Oh, yeah. Was that a funding package? Definitely. I wouldn't go to graduate school if they didn't pay for it. Exactly. Right. That's a, that was the, that, I mean, yeah, given what the expectation is and what the market is like afterwards, I just wouldn't recommend going to a place that offers loans or um, other kinds of partial stopgap measures to get you through. And that's a good question to ask, is if they say, well, we guarantee so much support, is to ask the question, you know, well, what about after that? What, what happens? Um, what do people do? And if they hem and haw, it's probably a good warning sign, um, just honestly. And the financial support's not that much anyhow. No. So, I mean, I would, I would never let the lure of the labors of love involved in being an academic um, offset the actual reality of austerity, which is, you know, eating, you know, ramen for many nights and, you know, Years. like, just real, exactly, I mean, yeah. you know, I'm not one to, you know, color things rosy, I mean, it's, it's really, really hard, I, um, and I will say that, that the union stuff really helped, I mean, we can say, like, systems are broken, but the day we got a union, we got dental and vision for the first time in my entire graduate career. And that was huge because my teeth were like falling apart by the end of grad school. I mean, it was just like, it, it made a huge difference. And people would say like, oh, well, I'm paying dues or it makes nothing. It, it actually made a real difference in our quality and standard of living. Yeah, I think, I think teeth are a big union issue, like wherever, wherever you are, it was for us certainly, but it's, uh, it's, it's probably like one of the health issues. Ask the scientists the about when the last time they went to the dentist is, and that was like a big conversation we had. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, I, I think the that sort of idea of austerity or the, or the idea of economic sacrifice is something that I think that, you know, I think probably most or all of us have encountered or will encounter, and, and all I would say to that is just a big part of what we you know, the challenge for us was to reframe, you know, that question from the sacrifices we make for yielding something down the road to uh, a question of political analysis of our structural situation right now, and uh, and then a call for economic justice, right? Which is which is a different question, you know, and um, and so constantly reframing that issue and not, uh, you know, and not tolerating, you know. This sort of discourse of you know you've got to you've got to put in your time and you've got to you know be uh, you know you've got, you've got to really harm yourself and be unhealthy so that you can get a you know get a PhD. That's uh, you know you we've got to all start to find that unacceptable uh, and we've got to we've got to you know we've got to do that much more and um, and and it's but it's it's really hard to do because I think we're all so delightfully surprised when we get into a program and you know, <coughs> want you want to want to enjoy it and do a good job in it. And the last thing on our minds is our own bodies and our own health and our own, you know, well-being. So, um, but all, all I would say is just, you know, the being aware that that is really the dominant discourse and need, the need to sort of constantly be framing it um, 
It's a question of economic justice. Because um, we're workers. Um, so, uh, a few things. First of all, this has been a great conversation. Um, really important. More people should have come. Say, um, yeah, good, good. Um, we all knew it was going to be reported, that's why. Okay, yeah, exactly. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll send the link out. So, um, no, it's really important, and, and I think to, to kind of come come back to, to your question, you know, looking at programs, I would echo everyone else and say, you know, a, a couple of things to look for. You know, one is the kind of, um, kind of jobs that are in, in assistance that's available like teaching assistantships and the salaries and that sort of thing, but then also tuition remission on top of that, which is hugely key, like don't, don't pay tuition. Yeah. 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 I, I, my own personal experience, I went to an MA program, a really good MA program where I paid tuition, but then the PhD program had tuition remission there. And I have some student loans from MA, but if I would have had PhD loans, it would be a much more dire situation. Um, so I, I, I really appreciate this conversation. I, a, a little bit of sort of my own perspective. I was a graduate student at University of Wisconsin from 2010 to 2015, which if anyone has followed, uh, uh, anyone who knows even a little bit about educational labor um, <laughs> uh, over the past six years, Wisconsin has been a complete debacle. Um, so my first year as a PhD student there um, was the year of the, the spring of 2010 with the budget repair bill protests uh, when the, the state stripped away collective bargaining rights from all public employees. Um, and a, a couple of things I think that that makes me think of or, or that, that a couple of things that have come up that that experience um, makes me think of is one, and this is sort of a, the, the question of sort of how to organize and how to sort of bridge across gaps. and this. this this isn't really an answer because it's very sort of limited, but just my own sort of perspective that one of the things that I think at Wisconsin um, helped people across the university really uh, react against that situation. And you know, it, it was a different situation which rights were stripped away rather than trying to organize to create a union. We, we had the TAA, which had been a grad student for decades at that point, um, was you know, a lot of the identification was about us as public employees um, and it being a kind of collective issue. Again, you know, this is not applicable, certainly in all, all cases, obviously. Um, but that really was, the, there was something about that, I think, that was a, a kind of like affective thing that, that, that helped, um, that, that, that helped connect across those sort of boundaries that might have been even difficult otherwise. And so I think, um, yeah, thinking about how to sort of appeal effectively in different ways is, is a way of helping that. I, I really like hearing um, about how you all sort of do that. Um, I guess one sort of general question, which is somewhat somewhat smaller scale, and, and, and I'll, I'll just kind of maybe throw it out there for anyone, is that um, in the fall I'll be joining the faculty at a department where I'll be teaching graduate students and advising not right away, but within a few years, in a few years at least. And, you know, I am, I was not, a, I was a grad student, you know, until just uh, uh, a year ago, basically, and uh, am, am aware of and care a lot about, um, you know, equitable labor conditions and humane labor conditions. And so I am, you know, I, I am wanting my perspective to not shift, you know, that much as I join faculty. And I guess I would just ask uh, what sort of advice anyone might have, or not even advice, but like, what, 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 what do you, what would you want from a faculty member, or uh, what do you think faculty members should remember, or do, or understand in order to? be able to work with students in ways that, that graduate students in ways that prepare them for a variety of job markets, but also uh, try to encourage and enable a humane, equitable labor uh, environment. I know that's a big question. Um, I, I, 
I would say really quickly uh, that you know I think that when you're in the heat of uh, an organizing campaign, do you ever find yourself in that in that position? There's a you know, pressure that might be happening, um, and uh, uh, it's it actually ends up being there's like an election happening, really important for the faculty to be neutral, so have neutrality, uh, and and it's something that um, uh, because really what can happen is if any faculty member were to stand up and you know passionately declare their support for the union, then you get a response and a backlash potentially. Um, and so, and so, just in terms of like logistics, um, that you know, it, and it does depend on timing. So if there's like an election happening next week, you know, better for you to just let it happen, let like the graduate workers do their thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm kind of thinking about uh, that, that question um, as I, I'm in, a, I'm in a different structural position now. And I'm like a faculty member in the department, and I, and I, I need to sort of, you know, somewhat think about how I can kind of advocate for these issues, or on behalf of colleagues, or on behalf of other people, um, when you know it's no longer in my own interest necessarily to do so. It's not for me. Um, but I think that this is really the, the, that question of sort of solidarity um, as academic workers, because that's really what we all share. Um, you know, graduate employees or academic workers, just like any, you know, uh, any of us. So, um, so I think that, and I think that thinking carefully about you know your role as an advisor will be important, and, and you know, making uh, because I you know I, I've heard horror stories. I have my own about you know advisors and advisor advisee relationships and. and very problematic. So um, you know, and, and and I think I think it's a very it's a it's sort of a lot of power to have, and, um, and so to kind of be aware of that power um, when you're interacting with your advisees. Um, There's a lot to learn about going to an institution, and I'm still learning. So you know, I would learn like the, so much to learn about the history of the institution. What are the rights of your students? I mean, I don't, you know, what are they to, I mean, I'm still digging through and learning myself, but I, I've been at this since July, so it's not a full year yet. So there's, I would go in sort of humbled and just, just learn, just sort of figure out what's there so that, you know, it's good so you're aware, so you know, because a lot of people won't know. Like, what are the, what are the conditions for the students here? So three suggestions. One, Listen to your students, even if like it's not that much time from your graduate experience. Their experiences are their own. Right. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time learning again when I had, uh, started having PhD students. What are the conditions? Like the salaries have gone up, but the conditions have gotten worse. So I had to listen to that to make their concerns um, voice them when the students say they need something, to don't say, oh, well, you should go ask for those things. Like, you have more power than them. You need to stand up. Join AAU, AAUP, yeah. right? <laughs> like, our voice. Yeah. Um, actually, four things. And when you do have things going on with administration, make those, um, make those attitudes transparent, because I feel like too often faculty end up being in the same position as grad students and internalizing all this toxicity at the top. And unless you like tell people like, oh my god, we're in a meeting and it's supposedly like so confidential and blah blah blah. But let me tell you what's going on, because like seriously, like we if we don't talk about those things, because you know, I mean you don't have to say name names, but like that those power relations need to be laid out. Um, to everyone. Yeah, on the learning, Leela already mentioned about learning, the learning about the new institution is so key because I remember a specific example of like an even well intentioned mistake. So, uh, for some of our funding packages, for example, some years will be a fellowship and then some of them will be a teacher. And one of our grad students um, brought up, I'm the grad representative for my, for my department. And they brought up the question of um, if I get an external fellowship on a year that I'm being covered by my funding as, as a TA, then can I just postpone that year as a TA? Um, and so I brought it up with uh, the 
faculty at, uh, at a meeting and one of the faculty members immediately said, oh yeah, that's fine, just postpone it. And then immediately the writer director stopped and they're like, actually, no, you cannot postpone it. it, it your outside fellowship sort of replaces your team. So those little, um, and for that other faculty member, they figured, yeah, it makes perfect sense. We already promised you this one year of TA ship. But then there were these other administrative things of how they're assigned, they're pre-assigned, so they're already kind of you as a TA for that year, but you're not kind of for you for a TA for the next year, right? So which is why they can't do it. Um, but not knowing those kinds of things um, then becomes sort of a problem because if if it had happened in a just general conversation in the hallway, that kind of would have been like, yeah, it's probably fine. The student assumes that it's they already have something for next year because I've just explored my TA ship and then bam, you. So, but those specifics then sort of pop up again. Yeah. 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 I don't mean to say that everything's broken and don't do anything. I what I what I mean is organizing in unions and being a business is critical. But I think that we also at the same time need to look structurally so I think, and, and you said it very, you know, very well. There are, those are two different. There are two different things. You need to survive. We need to survive, and we need to do it collectively. But at the same time, I think we should all, especially in being in the humanities, we, we have the tools to do that long view and to consider that. I think it's, that's, I just wanted to make that little addendum to what I said earlier. But I have this radical set part of me that wants to say, like, f it all, like. But you have to be at the same time, don't have it all. Like, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Not fully burning to the ground. <laughs> yeah, no, not totally like that. It's just a little bit. Yeah, and I think part of um, one of the key things that I was really interested in having this panel, but it's just the, the instructing, um, going away with the idea of the apprenticeship, the apprenticeship model, right? Because one of the, as I was becoming the that's one of the big things that I wanted to change is the idea of professionalization or, or as, as a thing. Because professionalization implies that what you're really doing is studying, but then on the side you're, you're preparing yourself to be a professional. So thinking of how you're already a, a professional and the sort of issues that already come up is, is the key. And, and like you mentioned, the, um, sort of dismantling the ideas of, you know, you should you have a higher um, calling and there should be an immediate community of negotiations or complaining that Starting with that, I think it's key. It's key. I thought I would have nothing to say, but I'm like, okay, like I'm just thinking of all these things that like. And, and solidarity yeah. networks, by the way, are not just in your institution; they're also like global, frankly. But they're, you know, these solid solidarity networks are critical. Like I'm just like listening to you. I would love, you know, I, I mean, it's just helpful to to. Stay in connection with, with, with your colleagues, and not just colleagues, but just you know other workers. Yeah. So to that Learn. point, right? Um, wherever you are, whether you're in the academy, out of the academy, what stage you are, it's always important to remember that whatever process is happening with a, another group, it will happen to you. That's how creative industries work, right? This is how. And, you know, I was at UC when faculty, you know, you know, talked the talk but didn't walk the walk on the pickets. And I was at UC Davis when the staff went on strike and so same bad. damn thing. And let me tell you, there were not a lot of staff and students who were all boo-hoo when the UC faculty got cut and like wages frozen and wages roll back. And I saw a lot of staff people like, yeah, you were so not there for us. I mean, that is like the kiss of, you know, like, and what do you think will happen? So, I mean, it's really, really important. Um, you know, universities now, the, the outsourcing of, um, you know, custodial labor, um, services, um, advising, health services, um, you know, you know, the, the, use of student athletes as the indentured servants. I mean, it's really, all these fights have to be, um, you know, the student loan scam. I mean, they're all like things that if you sit back and just um, talk and don't actually support, 
um, then you should not be surprised when the door comes knocking for you because that that that's been my experience. I've been you know 30 years now in the academy, so it's it's been well that that's I'm not that old, wait. <laughs> 20, 25, I think. <laughs> but yeah, it will happen. And and people of different, you know, uh, different so different um, personal life structures. Uh, align yourself with single people if you have a partner. If you if your colleagues have <coughs> kids, I did this having children. Um, daycare for me was is a, is a big issue in my life. Um, it's way ridiculously expensive. And um, you know, but, uh, what's it called? Maternity. You know, time off was really important. I had to, like, I was actually working up until the day, I, and then two, and then I was a TA when I delivered my first um, at UC Santa Cruz, and I was a TA. I'll never forget. I gave birth uh, November fifth. Two weeks later, I got this scathing letter from my professor who I was TAing for all the stuff that I hadn't done, and I'm like, dude. Just had a kid two weeks ago, so there was not, there was none of this, uh, yeah. So, but you know, but but people who don't, people who are, but then there are people who don't have another income, right? There are people, single people, and so my point is that graduate students are made up of older people, younger people, you know, trying to start families and all kinds of stuff. But I think it's important to be in solidarity and sort of have empathy for difference. Um, people come all with their different bodies and different. Right, and so just remember that too. Try to stay in solidarity with those who are, have different circumstances a little bit. And I think this is actually sort of the affirmational aspect of, of this, you know, workshop. Is is you know we can we can sort of be this sort of doom and gloom and really upset about all these bad changes that have happened, but it's also really exciting to recognize universities as public spheres and you know political spaces where. You know, there are lots of different people with different economic interests and that need to, um, that need to all be lifted up together. Um, and you know, lots of different workers who are unionized and you know, across campus, but then also lots of subcontracted folks that are being exploited all the time. And so um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting and exciting thing to do to be politically active and to really construct solidarity uh, you know, across and within University. Um, and uh, again, it's very hard to do because we're divided from each other in so many ways. But, yeah. um, you know, uh, and, and university administrations really love that. Um, but, you know, to, to struggle against that trend, you know, uh, of sort of alienation, right, um, is, uh, is really, really fruitful and it's really invigorating. And I mean, being a part of my union was the, one of the best things uh, I've ever done. It was really uh, enlightening and um, empowering and, uh, and exciting, and, and so you know these are. It, it's really an opportunity to be politically engaged, and um, I, would, I would encourage folks to follow that, follow that, uh, follow that path that opens for you. We're about ten, less than ten minutes, so I, I make some background comment. I want to invite if anyone else wants to sort of <clears throat> make any final remarks or big takeaways. Um, that this conversation is for. I have a few, but I want to see them here. Uh, anyone else? I guess just on the, on the note of solidarity, um, my, it's my own background right now. I'm at Indiana University, and my, my department in communication and culture was actually dissolved um, a couple of years ago and integrated with, it integrated to a new, newly formed media school that's very, like, very individualized. Research and it, it was integrated with telecom and journalism. And for the past few years, I've kind of watched with dismay as so many of the grad students across my former program and across telecom and journalism have basically been squabbling with each other over the new pie that's been presented to them, rather than recognizing like how the pie itself is kind of disenfranchising everyone equally. Um, it's only in the last couple of weeks that there's been a move to try to set up some sort of collective grad student, not necessarily like neighboring or anything like that, but definitely like an organization of some sort, just so we can express our grievances in unison to the department heads. Um, but that, that's relatively recent. And 
I just, I just wanted to share that. It's, I'm, I'm not sure what else I can go. I, I, I'm talking a lot, I'm sorry, but I, 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 I like Vicki, I feel like I suddenly have a ton of stuff to say. But, um, but I also had an experience, I just want to say, you know, organizing at the departmental level, um, and, and we got some limited changes accomplished and you know, kind of short term changes accomplished um, at this at a sort of limited scale. Um, and then, of course, you know, our ad hoc collective group, you know, kind of solved, we went our own ways, we entered our next year, and, you know, whatever. Stopped organized, being organized, um, and and the one thing that we really wanted to accomplish we couldn't get accomplished, and that's because it was a, a structural economic problem. And then uh, down the road, now that you know uh, bargaining is over, we have a contract at NYU. Um, that problem is now being corrected uh, by the contract, and so it really took. Um, and this is my plug for unionization again. It really took the teeth of you know a union contract. Uh, to be able to make the kinds of change that we had been organizing for several years before, um, that we just weren't weren't completely capable of doing it um, on our own, and, um, and and we were just up against too much. Um, but then, you know, unionization and contracts uh, really changed that. So, so I would just say, you know, there are there are things that really might uh, many more things that we get done, um, and, the, and the sky's the limit in terms of. Sorry, the university administration is the limit, I guess. But um, there, you know, there, there's really nothing that can't be in a union contract, right? You can, you can all everyone, you know, sort of decides and what can make it a union. Well, I was writing down three great things that I got from all the great comments, of course. Um, one was the aspect of participation in general, starting from organizing, from making sort of links across groups, but also making visible, uh, like, sort of like the attitudes, for example. That we don't know, and that itself goes goes a long way towards making uh, those connections. And just sort of the, the key importance of translation, translating across stems and humanities, for example, but um, also between faculty and what faculty doesn't remember, what it's like, or whatnot. Um, th those aspects of translation, which also goes back to um, we talked about blogs or different um, audiences. Yeah, that that can be a in all those cases, right? We're actually talking to different audiences and trying to make these concerns of how manage. So I guess um, teeth is a good takeaway. So talk about teeth, and that that'll start. That'll spark conversations. Um, yeah, talk about teeth. And I think I think Kelly put it really well in the sense we're all, at some level, got into acting or humanities for a particular reason. So there must be something driving us forward, despite all these other problems just keeping us back. But um, I would definitely be wary of issues and how we can do to change them, but don't let that deter you from sort of continuing. And I think it's great. Uh, uh, when Kelly shared the story, that was a good example of just like, don't let that deter you because uh, making these connections, and getting to know people, uh, speaking across difference always always helps. Uh,